Ambassador's dissertation presentation and defense, if you will. Um, we have two of the committee members online today because they can't be here with us. But let me just briefly introduce them. Um, our um, external faculty member is Dorit Netzer. Dr. Netzer is a colleague of mine from Sophia University, and she's interested in integral education and other uh, alternative education, so she's quite a fitting person, very helpful. And Matthew Brunson, you probably know Matthew, but... Matthew! Um, Matthew. Yeah. You have a fan club here, Matthew. <laughs> <laughs> so mutual, I love everyone. Um, Matthew has been uh, at the Institute for many years, for decades. Literally. 32. 32. <laughs> and for a good part of it, maybe 10 or 12, he was director of assessment, so he knows a lot about CIIS, about our programs, and uh, he was very helpful all along. So we have a lot of experts on this committee, including Heidi herself. I turn to you, Heidi. Please tell us about your process, and then we'll have uh, a few questions from the committee members. Some perhaps from the audience, and we'll go from there. Thank you. Welcome, everyone, and good afternoon. You guys on the phone hear me all right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. I just wanted to start with expression of gratitude. First, for everyone in this room that has been with me like for seven and a half years at CIS, some, some shorter, but a lot of you I've known since I started the MA here. And I also want to offer some gratitude to those who came before us. We have, I brought my dad here today. Um, he's got his Nietzsche sweatshirt on, he's a philosopher. <laughs> and on the back wall there we have Dr. Haridash Chaudhry, the founder of the Institute, and Sri Aurobindo and the mother, who I'll speak more about a little later. So, so thank you everyone, I feel full heart with all your presences. Let's see. And uh, the real gratitude also goes to my committee. I wanted to, I mean, you see Bauman here before you, uh, but I wanted to bring Matthew and Dory into the picture here, and they're their smiling faces. I feel so blessed. As Bauman said, I got a real team of experts here. We had lots of drafting. So, you're all here to hear me speak about the value of an integral education at CIS, a mixed method study with alumni from the East-West Psychology Program at the California Institute of Integral Studies. So basically, I'll just briefly talk about my own connection to the research topic and then I'll sort of situate it in the current conversation that's sort of sharing parts of my literature review. And then I'll talk with you more about the specifics of the study and the implications after that. So first off, basically before CIIS, I, I was like in a late Adolescence. I mean, I, I, I went through a whole bachelor's completion program, and I, I wasn't even sure what kind of learning happened. And this sort of explains where I was at. I was operating largely out of an egocentric place, which means I was, you know, very much self-centered, and I didn't even know it. Um, I'm going to also refer to my script because it's a lot more eloquent. <laughs> and although growing up I had two loving parents and was more than well provided for, I somehow developed this tendency to, to seek unconditional love and acceptance from outside myself. And I, I don't know where that came from, but as I was going through my bachelor's, uh, I wasn't even really there for that. I was more focused on my connections with people and being liked and accepted by people. And I, I really didn't even realize that until I came to CIS and I started to notice these habits of mind that were, were kind of ingrained in me. 
and I had a tendency to ruminate and go through waves of depression and abuse alcohol. And I'm not even saying I, I'm completely healed or I've gotten more spiritual or I'm a lot better now, but in a sense, in another sense, I, I, I am a lot better now because now I can actually notice when these habits of mind creep up and I can actually without judging them, I can welcome them. As Rumi says, you know, meet them all at the door laughing. <coughs> so my experience in EWP was really crucial in discovering and refining my self-awareness. And I just want to reiterate, reiterate, it's not like I achieved something, like I made it and I'm there and there's no more growth. That's another thing that East-West psychology gave me is this evolutionary perspective of life. And, and it's like I can continue to grow until I decide I don't want to grow anymore. <laughs> so I could continue to grow until I pass into the next what comes. So aside from the personal, like why should we study alternative <coughs> models of education? Because integral education at CIS is actually <coughs> It's a little different from a mainstream model. And, and what I mean by a mainstream or more traditional model is if you look at higher education in the United States today, it's largely focused on intellectual development and assessment of that development. But an integral education actually is striving to do something different. It's, it's trying to educate the whole person. So I thought it'd be great to study one alternative model because right now there's a real crisis. People are talking about the state of higher education in the U.S. as in a crisis way and I thought this image of, of the beached whale kind of was a good metaphor for the crisis because this image sort of shows that, you know, this whale is out of its element and there needs, and it's stuck, and there needs to be some kind of change in order, you know, for it to survive. And if, if the root of the word education, educare, means to draw out and bring forth what's already within the student, then this banking model, and by banking model I mean this transmission of knowledge from teacher to student, that, that kind of strays far from that meaning of to draw out, to bring forth. <clears throat> and in addition to this sort of crisis state going on, my research comes at a real opportune time in the field of educational research at large because in the last decade, there's actually been two commissions formed. The Spellings Commission, which is a collaboration between Sorry, I just want to get it right. The Spellings Commission is a collaboration between the Council of Graduate Schools and the Educational Testing Service. And ultimately, this collaboration gave rise to the Commission on the Future of Graduate Education. And the Commission of the Future of Graduate Education wanted to know precisely what is the path from graduate student to working professional. And I thought, yeah, what is the path from graduate student and in integral education to working professional? So my study kind of just comes at a good time. Sorry, that's a little preemptive. So even with this increasing interest in student learning outcomes and this sort of crisis state, in the last five decades or more, actually even started in before the 19th century, the conversation. A lot of alternative models or progressive models, I'll use those terms interchangeably, they've been sort of emerging here and there in higher education institutions across the U.S. And I'm going to basically, and these were actually foundational in my lit review, so I'm going to go through them briefly. The first
first is perspective transformation, and this was something spearheaded by Dr. Mesero from Columbia University. Basically, he was working with a group of women who, who were non-traditional learners. They were adult learners, and they were returning to school after a long period of you know, not being in school or, or being housewives, kind of like in their role of, as a woman as determined by society in the 70s. And basically he observed that through intentionally engaging in the inquiry of how one's positionality biases epistemology or how one believes what they believe and how it affects how they know what they know about the world and in turn how they act about the world, he noticed that they were able to experience a perspective transformation. And he calls a perspective transformation, I'm just gonna read his words so you have an idea of what he was specifically talking about. Perspective transformation is the process of becoming critically aware of how and why our assumptions have come to constrain the way we perceive understand and feel about our world. Changing these structures of habitual expectation makes it possible to form a more inclusive, discriminating, and integrating perspective, and finally helps us make choices and acting from these new understandings. So, so, so basically, these women they became aware of these unquestioned cultural myths that they didn't know they had internalized. And in that awareness, they were able to create a new meaning perspective or a new frame of reference of how they see themselves in the world. So another model that emerged after Mesro in the 80s was Robert Boyd he came out with something he called transformative education. And basically, it's a little different from what Mesero was talking about because Boyd was using Jung's principles of integrating unconscious contents into conscious awareness, recognizing, communicating with, and integrating the many aspects of personality, shadow, etc., and individuation as something that could enrich education. And here's just a brief example of what Boyd's transformative education looks like. He was working with a student named Mary, and she actually had some intense reactions to the professor she was working with. And some of the students, when she shared this, sort of related whether some of them wondered, like, where did that come from? And basically what she did was she went home and watched a video of the class later. And she had this realization that the professor reminded her of her father. And then more separate from that personal, you know, reminding of the father, it was like she realized that when she's around authority figures, something's triggered in her. So. That is kind of like an example of transformative education because she was working with unconscious material and basically in recognizing the pattern, she was able to grow from that. Sorry, I'm just trying to read and make sure I cover everything. So, a third type of emergent model was student-centered education, and the learner is actually at the heart of a student-centered education. And a student-centered education really invites the professor to shift gears a little bit. Basically, the professor needs to be actively curious about what creates a will to learn in the students. And they shouldn't really be concerned with like, oh, did I cover all my syllabus? But like, oh, did the student actually learn and how do we know? 
So it was a little shift in focus with the student-centered education. And then contemplative practice has been integrated into mainstream higher education over the last 50 years as well. And the argument for bringing contemplative and reflective practice into the education setting is the need for something that must work deeper. We will need to transform the very container of consciousness and make it more subtle, supple and complex. So and now I'd like to focus on integral education because from what I've been studying, it seems like an integral education actually encompasses all the models I just briefly went through. But what is an integral education? Just put simply, it's an education for a whole person. But if you actually conducted a Google search for whole person education, there's actually a lot of schools that use this language. And Jesuit education has long been concerned with bringing the spiritual into the education setting and multi-dimensional development of students. But the integral education at CIS is distinct. And that's why I wanted to uh, let you know about the other things too. An integral education at CIS historically offers an education that honors the totality of the human phenomenon. So, whoops, sorry. Okay, so basically, let me just unpack this a little bit. I wanted to try, and so, so this is like an individual here. It's multi, we're, we're multi-dimensional beings. There's a body, there's a physical, there's emotional, instinctual, there's intellectual, pragmatic, and then there's a transpersonal. And then, but there's also a relational component between individuals, between cultures, and then you can even develop a global perspective. And then I have this spirit kind of as the core and the, and the foundation in, in this image. So, integral education at CIS honors the multidimensionality of students, and it also seeks to nurture uh, an expanding awareness. This, like here, is me, my egocentric self, and then sometimes you can branch out and think about, okay, all of us in my community, sometimes you can branch out and think, oh, all of us humans. And then I added this piece here, a cosmocentric perspective, because in my experience at CIS, I was able to eventually bring the whole universe and all beings into my awareness. Another distinction of the integral education at CIS comes from the integral yoga philosophy of Sri Aurobindo and the mother. Basically, these two people were the, they first coined the term integral education uh, in the early 1900s and it was originally envisioned to be an education, elementary education. <laughs> And just briefly, what integral yoga philosophy, it's, it's kind of like a way of life. They, 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 would, they themselves wouldn't call it a religion or anything like that. What's unique about it is they want to meet a person where they're at. So if you're a Buddhist, then, then that's, that's your path, and, and they honor that in the integral tradition. <clears throat> and there's no prescribed path in the integral yoga. It's like if you have, like some practices, you have you know, contemplative prayer or you do 20 minutes of meditation twice a day. For integral yoga, there's no prescribed path. 
And what's unique about integral yoga too is there's an aspiration or will to live in service of the divine rather than acting from an egocentric place. Integral yoga is kind of about cultivating an embodied spiritual attitude or way of life with the ultimate end being not personal salvation but the collective liberation of mankind. So it's like, this is really huge to me. <laughs> and so just, I'm gonna briefly just go through the worldview assumptions of integral because really integral worldview underpins the integral education at CIS. So integral worldview assumes the non-dual nature. So basically instead of being there a split between the body and the mind, for example, Body, mind, spirit is a continuum. There's no separateness. It's all interconnected. But on the other hand, it also assumes multidimensionality. So in, in spite of the, the non-separation, there's infinite <coughs> manifestation. Thirdly, holism is an assumption of an integral worldview. And holism, you know, we could talk about for hours, but briefly, asserts that all parts are inseparable from the whole and that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. It, is, it recognizes the urge toward wholeness as primary and holds the belief that humans seek to actualize this primary innate potential. And lastly, an integral worldview assumes the evolutionary nature of life. And this notion begs questions like, what if the human being is a transitional being and not the final product? What if human psychological and spiritual growth is the locus of an evolution of consciousness? This historical context is really important because I feel like that's really what makes integral education at CIS really distinct from any other whole person education you might see. And this is Dr. Haridash Chaudhary. He's a Bengali philosopher who wrote the first dissertation on uh, Aurobindo's Integral Yoga. And he, with, well, actually one of the last things Aurobindo did before he passed was he gave his blessing to send Dr. Chaudhary here to bring Integral to the States in a more profound way. And he actually was first at the American Academy of Asian Studies with Alan Watts and Dr. Spiegelberg from Stanford. And while he was doing that, he founded the Cultural Integration Fellowship and later founded CIAS, California Institute of Asian Studies, which is now CIIS. I just wanna briefly mention his triadic formula for integral psychology. It sort of just expands on the what we were talking, you know, what the characteristics of integral, you know, you have the personal, which he refers to as uniqueness, relatedness, which is the inter Personal and transcendent, which is the transpersonal. And this triadic formula, Dr. Shirazi uses personal, interpersonal, and transpersonal, and this will be helpful to understand how the scale uh, sort of came to be when we get to that part. So. <laughs> To encapsulate the integral worldview and how it inspired the integral education at CIS, I want to give you some of Dr. Chaudhry's own words. There is a holistic impulse, an integrative urge of our total being to reconcile opposites, 
an urge in which instinct and intellect, passion and reason, impulse and law, emotion and thought, self and society, psyche and cosmos intermingle in an all-embracing organic relationship. And he said, the great challenge of our time is to restore this organic relationship with sound educational methods. And that's basically part of the inspiration for this study too, is like, I know he believes that we're doing that at CIIS, so why aren't we documenting that in, the, in a study? So basically the grand tour question of the whole study is how do alumni of the East-West Psychology Department value their non-traditional graduate education, specifically in terms of their personal transformation and professional development. And before I get into the specifics of the study, I would just like to, to let you know why I chose such an interesting term as transformation. Basically, if you look at this image and consider the process of a caterpillar, how it wraps itself in a cocoon, and somehow emerges a butter butterfly. To the lay person, there's something magical, unexplainable, yet awe-inspiring that happens to carry along this type of metamorphosis. The caterpillar actually ceases to exist to, to give rise to the emergence of the butterfly. The transformation alluded to in this inquiry can be likened to this phenomenon, and can even be experienced as having an alchemical quality, since alchemy involves transmuting precious uh, metals into precious stones, as well as the quest for the philosopher's stone and life elixirs. And this transformation in the context of this study also indicates intentionality and teleological purpose. So for my study, I did a sequential mixed method. Um, in the first phase, it was quantitative. I used a mixed data survey, which included collecting demographic information, a 40-item Likert scale, and three open-ended questions. And the second phase, I used semi-structured interviews. <coughs> I wanted to do a mixed method because I wanted to collect data from as many people as possible and because really just choosing one only kind of gives one side of the story. The participants was like purely a sample of convenience. Um, out of 161 alumni who we had on file email addresses, um, 48 completed the questionnaire but I actually I had to take one out because there was a lot of uh, like there were only three questions answered so it was at, you know 47 actually and then of those who took the survey I used that as the participant pool for the second phase and 10 people came forward to do an interview with me <coughs> so I used SurveyMonkey to collect the data for the scale and it also helped me kind of process the data as well. And on page, if, if you guys wanna look at your handout, there's, I've included the, the scale. And if you remember the figure I showed you on, with Dr. Chaudhry's triadic formula, these, these statements on the scale were actually categorized personal, transpersonal, interpersonal, because that was our attempt to see if people agreed or disagreed whether or not they were getting that multidimensional education. So, for example, as an alum, I still feel part of the community. That's categorized as interpersonal. As a result of my EWP education, my ability for authentic self-expression improved. So that would be personal. 
Being emotionally supported while completing my degree contributed to my spiritual transpersonal development. So there were 13 questions for each category, and the participants did not know what the categories were. And there was one overarching question to end the scale. In, your, uh, in retrospect, I have a positive experience overall. And then if you look on page five, I have summarized the demographic data of the participants of the survey. It was great. We had a various age range. We had almost equal numbers of MA and PhD people fill out the survey, males and females. I failed to leave that option as no choice. Two people decided not to disclose that. I should have known. I'm at CIS. I should have been more mindful of that. <laughs> And then I've also included the, the interview questions too for you guys. The umbrella question for the survey was who were you before, during, and after your graduate education in East-West Psychology? Because I wanted to see if the transformation would reveal itself in a story rather than just, hey, did you transform while you were doing your degree? go through the validity. A mixed method in itself could be considered as a way to up the validity of a study because you're collecting data in multiple formats. External validity was not a major concern. The findings revealed were not used in an attempt to generalize the study to graduates of other programs or schools. In the quantitative phase, the survey had face validity and content validity. It does not involve construct validity because construct validity refers to the extent to which operationalizations of a construct. Basically, to what ex here's an example that Bauman gave me. To what extent does IQ test actually measure intelligence? The limitations to the study, the sample was limited because we actually have over 300 alumni and we only had 161 emails. I didn't try to mail things to people and some people actually passed away. <clears throat> Other potential limitations are validity. Uh, the, the study relied on honest self-reports. It relied on people reflecting back. Uh, and, and there was a range, you know, some participants had just graduated, some participants had graduated in the 70s, so. <clears throat> Specifically in the first phase, I thought maybe afterthought, of course, it might have been more effective to ask the open-ended questions first, so get participants to talk about it in their own words before giving them all the statements on the scale, like, because afterwards I was like, well, maybe the, did that prime the pump, so to speak? Additionally, researchers' subjectivity and personal assumptions, I'm sure, influence the study, especially because I have such a multi-dimensional role at the Institute. Alumna, current student, I work at the school, so I had to be very careful. I, I basically had a whole section in my method talking about personal heuristic and my assumptions prior to the study, which I sort of shared at the beginning. <clears throat> Lastly, it's important to reiterate that these are not going to be generalized across programs at the school or across other institutes. And since the program itself has sort of changed throughout the years, 
that was important to pay attention to, like what year is this person responding from? Here's what everybody wants to know, right? <laughs> There's a lot of data. The return rate on the survey was 29%. And just in regard to the scale, all I want to say is most people agreed with the statements. So most people overall, I'd say, had a, a generally a positive experience in the program according to the scale. The open-ended responses were really like the most rich. I asked, in your view, what characterizes an integral education? Uh, 20, so you also have in your little packet here, Uh, on page six, summary of the open-ended results from the first phase. I'm not going to go through everything, but I just wanted you to get an idea of, of what came up. I'll just touch on the major ones, and then if you guys have questions after, that'll be good. So, basically 28% responded that an integral education honors multiple ways of knowing, and these, these were varied in the individual response. Embodied knowing, mythical knowing, magical knowing, mental knowing, and knowing that comes from teachings, research, personal experience, as well as art, music, and intuition. Also, 23% of participants noted an integral education honors and values the multidimensionality and complexity of the individual's subjective human experience as well as also honors diverse worldviews, perspectives, and viewpoints of others. The second open-ended question included was, please describe how your EWP learning experience and degree completion contributed to your personal development. And if not applicable, simply state that. The most prevalent response pointed to a deepened and or expanded sense of self-understanding, self-awareness, and self-knowledge. 49% reported that. One alumni said it like this, the learning experience allowed me to observe, recognize, and listen to my intuition and sense of personal guidance. It helped me to regain my personal story and life narrative. Another responded that they were able to become more attuned to their strengths and another said it helped them unearth and integrate shadow material. With these, respondents also reported a greater awareness of assumptions, particularly limiting ones, and they were guided on how to transform them. 15% acknowledged being encouraged to explore multiple ways of knowing contributed to personal development, interpersonal interactions, healing, and worldview expansion. Interestingly, too, 15% said that their transformation and development was already in progress and would have happened in spite of coming here to study, or that the program enriched it, you know, sped it up. Third and final open-ended question, Please describe how your EWP learning experience and degree completion contributed to your professional development. If applicable, simply state that. If not applicable, simply state that. 30% said not applicable. So that's pretty significant. Three people, in addition to that, three people offered a thorough critique of the program in that question. <clears throat> there were also, I coded one of, the res one of the themes as indirect because people were talking about, you know, in increased acceptance, uh, you know, better able to handle confrontational situations. I think these are very valuable gifts, but I think that indirectly impacts your professional world. It, it definitely 
is a positive impact, but it's not like someone's going to say, hey, you can accept others in a profound way. Let me give you a job. <clears throat> okay, so for the second phase of the study, of the 10 interviews, there were 23 individual interview themes, which I didn't list for you, but in your packet on page 8 and 9, you have the table that shows the major and minor themes that came up in the interviews, uh, the overarching ones, and then also a table that sort of gives voice to the distinctness of the more ambiguous themes. The major, major theme was what came up in everybody's interview was this self-directed learner seeker tendency. A person who, and this was quoted by a person who displayed a strong will to learn through seeking to satisfy their curiosities what they were called to study, really. The theme is also considered as a characteristic of one's lifestyle, a characteristic that became apparent in all the stories when they were talking about their life before CIS. And it also showed up in the rest of the story, but that's what I thought was interesting. So basically, what I feel this study gives us is insight into the type of people that come to our school. And, and if we already knew that, you know, at least it's just starting to document that. <clears throat> and basically, what came up as sort of minor themes, actually, the other day I realized could be a major theme. Because if you look on page 8, three people reported what EWP lacked, three people reported a critique of the program, two people reported no bridge from graduating back into society as a productive member, and two people reported that there's a shadow side to spirituality and higher education. If you, if you combine all those, that's ten criticisms and learning edges. So that's sort of a major theme, but I didn't want to lose participants' articulations. That's why they're sort of articulated separately. Can you maybe take about five more minutes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm going to summarize yeah, the results, right, and then talk about the, the, the next steps. So investigating alumni perspectives on the value of their non-traditional graduate education was beneficial because it gave voice to the people who actually went through the degree program. In phase one, each theme from the open-ended questions was considered in light of CIS's educational philosophy and uh, seven ideals. Despite some themes being revealed, they cannot be generalized. The main characteristics of an integral education that were noted by participants were honoring the multidimensionality of being and simultaneous development along multiple lines of intelligence, the valuing of multiple ways of gaining valid knowledge, and in regard to personal development, participants emphasized an expanded sense of self and transformation already in progress in connection to their EWP education. Professionally speaking, participants mostly reported no effect or an indirect effect, but others reported that their academic development during the PhD was linked to their professional development post-graduation. Concerning the second phase, I would like to bring the reader's attention to the relationship between some of the themes, specifically spiritual emergence and or emergency and synchronistic unfolding could be a way to describe certain characteristics of the life of a seeker. 
Additionally, takeaways from an EWP education could be a more specific way to describe a positive aspect of EWP. And what EWP lacked could be a form of critique. Overall, the results of the study point to areas where the program is doing well in terms of what students expect and what they actually get, and also to the areas that could use improvement if they were to better reflect the ideals espoused by the Institute. The implications of the findings have the potential to be significant to the CIS community, to higher education institutions, educators and researchers and students interested in alternative models of education. And basically, there could be so much more to, to go from this. I mean, I, I would be so interested to have the scale be, you know, worked on after this study to, to make it valid and maybe used throughout the institute. Um, the participants in, in the study could even maybe be invited to, to participate again in five years and, and create a longitudinal study from this, or it would be very interesting to do a longitudinal study from the start, like let's talk with people when they're starting the program, you know, at marking points during their degree, you know, and then after they graduate or five years after they graduate. Because that was one of the interesting things, actually. Some of the people who I interviewed who had just, just graduated, I think they were still struggling to articulate what's the professional value they just finished. So, and since then, I, I know just by conversing with them, uh, unofficially, I know there, that a lot's changed since our interview. And I also know that our department is already working on some of the stuff that came up as like ways we could grow. Like this semester we started having uh, a community council for our students led by Ishtar, and that was like in direct response to some of the study we had been doing for our WASP review, uh, and students wanted more community support and we're having more professional development courses uh, every semester, so it's like we're already on track to be integrating some of the information I've gathered. And basically, I just, to conclude, I'll say, you know, it probably revealed more questions than answers, however, the, the data is relevant to the East-West program, CIS, and higher educational assessment research in general, I feel. I feel like we're, we're out of time, so. I just wanna say thank you and see what questions you have. <laughs> information to go through and I'm sure there are a lot of questions that come up and um, uh, when the dissertation is ready there will be a, a good chance for everybody to look at it. But let's start with the committee members and with Dorit. Uh, Dorit, if you have any questions or comments, go ahead. Yeah, um, thank you Heidi. Uh, Baman, do I have uh, just a couple of minutes or? No, we do have time. We do have time. Take your time. Okay. Well, Heidi, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm sitting here, and uh, this is, I mean, a very uh, quiet space, but I recognize how uh, challenging um, it is to, you know, extract and present um, and highlight uh, the value of your study, and you've done a beautiful job of it. So thank you. I was um, following along um, with your PowerPoint presentation and uh, handout. You know, I provided you many comments and suggestions uh, along the way, but I, I thought perhaps today, um, having uh, listened to your presentation, um, that I can offer something more um, 
of a personal observation about your choice of topic and process, if that's okay? Yeah, please. Okay. Well, you know, to me there's no question that you went about your study in an ethical manner, in a thorough and um, studious scholarly manner, and, it, you know, you've had a committee uh, to ensure that that was the case. And um, you've done an excellent job acknowledging the heuristic and dual relationship, you know, uh, kind of risks that you've undergone by choosing to research your own education, your own um, educational program. But besides, you know, the fact that this had been an ethical program evaluation of sort, you know, um, I want to say that I've observed along the way how, how courageous it's been for you uh, to look at your own educational institution and your own education, especially when um, your own perception of was it worth it to me is at stakes, you know, when you expose yourself to all the all the voices of others. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a lot, you know, when you've taken so many years for a graduate education and to risk shaking that by mm -hmm. maybe being, um, you know, it being um, colored by other, the, you know, the, the various voices you've opened yourself to. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you began today, and I noticed that, you, you shared uh, that in your early phase of post-secondary education, you know, as an undergraduate student, you were focused on your social-emotional development, mm -hmm. you know, put, <laughs> put nicely, <laughs> you know. And in a way, you know, even back then, I think you realized that although, like, we're not from a conscious place, that, you know, there is more to your education than regurgitation of information, grades, and you know, so on. Mm. So in doing this study, you have expanded your own direct examination of your experience in, in the East-West Psychology Program and opened um, it to include other voices and their educational experience in this program over a long period of time. And granted, um, the organic nature of the program and changes that you have not all undergone exactly the same education. But by, you know, by the same token, um, you know, even without ge the generalization of your specific findings, um, what you have discovered is highly valuable to the current, uh, today's, now uh, East-West Psychology program at CIS, and other programs, especially those that aspire to provide uh, transformative whole person or uh, integral education. Mm. Um, so that is an interesting thing, and that I don't think that it's because your study has uh, included a quantitative measure or because it, it's so well uh, um, provided thick descriptions uh, qualitatively. It really is because there is a need to look at ourselves and juxtapose our ideals, our aspirations in, um, you know, transformative learning with what is actually happening in the field and what what is students' direct experience. And you know, besides your own discernment um, and um, our clarity that your individual experience um, or other individual experience cannot be generalized to others and even when there is a certain large majority or a substantial um, findings uh, in terms of uh, agreement about any aspect of what's lacking and what needs improvement, um, that the personal and the collective, um, you know, don't always um, are reflective of one another and cannot be, are not transferable. And at the end of the day, we're called to both look at our, ourselves as a community of learners and our ideals and our, and how is it that we exercise them, but also on um, moments and specific experiences um, that sometimes override some dysfunctional, you know, or less than ideal 
um, exercise uh, of, uh, you know, of, um, of uh, let's say, mission statements uh, or values. Mm -hmm. So let me just conclude by saying that, you know, um, among the many comments that I provide you along the way, I brought up the question of identifying those alumni in your study, and that's perhaps for future studies, that responded from a participatory viewpoint on their part, mm -hmm. and they seem to have responded differently to their East-West East -West psychology experience, warts and all, you know, compared to those um, who described how their expectations from the program were or were not met. And that, you know, that really takes me back to that balance between, um, you know, solid and ongoing evaluation of programs, but also not forgetting that, um, you know, when, when it comes to transformative learning and learning that is, um, you know, intuitive and alive as opposed to formulaic, um, that um, students need to participate in their education and take responsibility for their experience. And that being said, you know, um, we are in a real world and, uh, you know, education and professional education as such, uh, as such is, um, is, is responsible to um, students to help them bridge their, um, you know, sheltered um, school experience with, with uh, professional application in the world. And I would say that that's one of the things that your study is um, driving uh, loud and clear, and I thank you for that. Thanks, Dorit. Thank you. Uh, do you want to respond to that? Just, oh. yeah. um, I just don't know what to say. <laughs> um, yeah, what really stuck out for me when you were talking, Dory, is when you said juxtapose ideals with what is actually happening in students' experience. And yeah, basically at CIS, we, you know, we were, we're we practice innovative governance, which means we're we're constantly wanting to learn and grow from what we find, you know, what we find out, what's working, what could be better, okay, how we can grow, repeat. It seems like that's really part of what we aspire to do at CIIS. So if that's what we do, then I also feel like we definitely need to document these processes. And I mean, with my hope that it would be able to give people some kind of understanding and and basically for my colleagues and myself included like what I'm really passionate about is is helping us be able to get a mainstream job and be able to communicate effectively how what we did was just very valuable mm. that's so. right that's good yeah <laughs> sounds sounds like uh, she doesn't have much to respond beyond that, but do you have any more questions, Dori, before we turn to Matthew? No, no, thank you. Okay, well, thank you on, on my part for your Thanks, warm Dori. and uh, yeah. uh, really great comments always. Uh, Matthew, if you're still there, we need your, we need your response and questions, too. <laughs> thank you so much. You know so much about CIIS, and you've been reading his, this dissertation in the last couple of weeks, so I'm wondering what's come up for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, um, it, it's been a, a wonderful experience because it kind of was my fantasy when I was working there in that job that there would be a lot more of this going on. <laughs> <laughs> so um, in my mind, um, assessment at CIS or anywhere should be like the conscience of the institution, its own best ethical and, and, and trajectory towards integrity, because it's the question where we ask, 
what is the difference between what we aspire to and what we have actually created in practice. So that's a continual point of evaluation in anthropology. You know, we call it the theory of ideal versus the theory of practice. And um, your study, um, Heidi, square, falls squarely in that um, area, really, of the you know, evaluation science, if you will, of looking at the difference between what one aspired to do and what was achieved. So that, to answer your question, Bob, and that to me is very exciting to see a study of this breadth and depth, because this goes way beyond what I could have asked of my programs during program review when I was at, um, when I was the director of assessment there. So the, I, I appreciate very much the, the depth and the breadth in which um, Heidi was getting into this question of um, what we said we were trying to do and then what was happening in practice. I think um, that this study or versions of it should be replicated within all the programs. So I'd love it if there were a Heidi in uh, PCC <laughs> or you know other programs because I think this kind of um, reflective practice is something that we as professors couldn't do, but the graduate students are positioned to do that kind of thing. And particularly when we are articulating new versions and new visions of pedagogy, this fundamental scholarship of teaching and learning is really essential. So Heidi, in case you didn't know it, you're working in the field of scholarship of teaching and learning. Mm -hmm. So welcome to the field. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Ryan. And um, uh, yeah, that's, that, that was, those, were, those felt like um, some things to say. And something um, else, Bob, and I'm picking up on your question. I, I felt that, um, mm -hmm. I think sometimes at CIS, um, we, we get a little bit precious about ourselves, and we, um, we, can, we can create a kind of hermetically sealed conversation in, in which our highest ideals, now this is somebody who's been out in the world here for a year and a half and like uh, de decompressing, and I think we can profess um, our high ideals and um, in a sense almost become entranced by them to where we don't actually look and see how it plays out. I think this study is very timely in that, um, you know, when, when people were not graduating with huge amounts of student debt and back in the easygoing 80s and 90s, the premise of an education which was fundamentally about transformation and then the world would presumably welcome this new transformed subject, that I think was a, a, a reasonably sustainable fiction in 1995, but it's not in 2015. It's just not. And um, so the, uh, the idea of something that I, I think an outcome of your study that I, I would recommend is um, ongoing reflection from the beginning of people's programs in which they are thinking about these issues yeah. and naming their own transferable skills. So a, some good news here is that a lot of the stuff that we are encouraging people to do in the EWP program are in fact transferable skills. And here's a news flash. I just counted four CIS grads on my payroll over here. Nice. <laughs> I'm at Dominican University, for those of you who don't know, I'm the director of assessment. Or need a job. At Dominican <laughs> University of California. And um, our uh, CIS people get jobs over here because they, they like that cool stuff we're doing. So, um, and uh, I see many of the same parallels here at Dominican. Uh, where they call it an engaged education as opposed to an integral education. Mm -hmm. So one, um, one place in terms of scaling this up and outward would be to um, approach other programs and departments that are trying to do the same thing and talk to them about how they're doing their assessment and how they're working with their alums. Yeah. Because I think this is a kind of model study that you, know, you could even get some work as a consultant perhaps um, to help people get their arms around this stuff. The whole question of what is transferable, um, it turns out that we may have a more restricted idea of that than the workplace, and that um, our students who are able to tap the 100 billion cell galaxy in their heads and um, make things happen with it in the world, I think we have a powerful story potentially to tell there. A question that I wanted to kind of um, uh, have you think about okay. is um, if you were, um, how would I say this? I'm trying to think how to, how to 
phrase this. I guess it would be sort of like um, if you were going to speak back to the that whole alternative and progressive education um, set of communities that you outlined at the beginning, I sort of get what you want to say back to EWP and CIS. What would your study, now that it's complete, what do you think you'd want to say back to a Dominican University or a Sophia or a JFK that is going about this business of alternative or, or transformative education in 2015? If you were going to give them some advice about how to structure their programs or their assessments based on your study, what would you say to them? You mean like what I would recommend things to them? Yes, if you were recommending, like that you're talking to another program. Yeah. Now you're you're hired as a consultant. Okay, here you are. You got your brand new job, and you're coming into a university, and you're trying to. They're saying we have all these wonderful transformative aspirations, but our people struggle to get jobs. We don't know what to do. We don't know what's happening with our students. What what might you tell them? Well. I guess more than recommending, I would want to just have a conversation with them and, and so we could like share with each other like what best practices we each have and, and what challenges we each have and, and maybe from those discussions we could enrich each other's researches. But if I was going to recommend something to them about how to assess, it would, you know, it would just be, I would recommend that it's ongoing, like constantly reviewing, you know, how you market yourself and then then giving alumni and current students the chance to critically reflect on their experience and then seeing how the two match up. I think that's important. Something I noticed here, um, we had several program reviews that I was reading mm -hmm. and they were absolutely free of any student data. Like, oh, like they didn't even tell the, the, the student that the program was under review. And I thought, well, that's a really good way to keep the complaints down. <laughs> <laughs> it's like double secret probation, right? I'd also add, I would like to get faculty involved in the conversation because I, like for example, it'd be really interesting to me to interview or survey faculty members to understand their understanding of integral or transformative education and then uh, talk with them about what what does that look like in their practice. I think that would be a really good follow-up because you know I did my dissertation about CIS too. I was yeah. like, looking at the international students yeah. and how we were socializing them to writing and one thing that I discovered, Danielle Delorier was one of my uh, informants and he, it was extremely helpful to plumb with him the tension between the transformative and the kind of preparation for scholarship. Yeah. And, and I think it's interesting because you have the premise in your study that, that the faculty in EWP were about this and were making this thing happen, which they apparently were. <laughs> but of course, lots of people were swapping in and out in the background, right. even, even as the promise in the course catalog changes, right? The players change. And I'm thinking of a long discussion I had with a couple of people in PCC where they were sort of saying, well, application, jobs, well, what are you going to do with a master's in philosophy? That's kind of not our problem. It's more the problem of the field of philosophy. And I think that those discussions need to come back around, especially in this day and age, that we can't afford to not be thinking about that, um, that missing bridge. Mm -hmm. and, and if you recall, I even had a program called Building the Bridge. Yeah. <laughs> Because I felt that was really true of our grads as well. This this whole question of how um, of how skills get transferred. Yeah. Um, let me see. Was there was one other thing? Uh, I guess one thing that I would encourage as follow up is for you to continue to um, connect with the national discussions around assessment. Yeah. Because I think your work is important, and um, it's a counterpoint to a sort of fetishization of the quantitative. Yeah. And this idea of rich, deep, qualitative ethnographic work, um, I don't see much of it out here. And I think it's because it takes a long time to do, as you've discovered. 
So uh, I would just encourage you to you know think about that, um, about joining the national conversation. And I guess the one last thing that I would ask you is, what, how have you been changed now that you look back on Heidi 1.0? <laughs> who began this process, how would you reflect on the shifts in your own subjectivity? And also, I know that you seem to be talking and walking with more confidence. <laughs> I wonder if you might say something about the transformation that led us to that. I mean, I was just like writing about this earlier in the week because I feel like I'm a completely different person who's the same person. <laughs> And what was really major for me throughout all this process, I sort of hinted at was, you know, discovering and developing self-awareness, but also basically self-compassion. Mm -hmm. I didn't even, I, you know, for some reason I just, just really rude to myself, and I still am, and, but, but, you know, I, yeah, I just want to talk well, about self-compassion. Well, no, but I think what you're getting at there is, of course you were rude with yourself, because everything in culture and everything about the graduate experience would have led you to that, yeah. right? It's yeah. like, it, it is a particular kind of hell that we've managed to co-construct, <laughs> you know, for the privatized dissertation. But I think what your study aims to get at, and I would invite you to think about this, and you're going through this yourself, is how do we break that cycle of abuse? Yeah. How do we stop doing to the next generation what was done to us, right? Yeah. And I think your being incredibly harsh on yourself is an example of that internalized depression. You know, you're almost like giving yourself a bad peer review, you know? <laughs> Yeah. And it can be different. Because we can't have the rigor and the compassion. Yeah. Uh-huh. Bauman, I'm, uh, I'm good. You can pick, it, pick up the rain whenever you'd like to. But I, I, Thanks, Matthew. I, I'm just, uh, I did want to say um, I'm incredibly proud of you. I feel like I was with you from the very beginning you of this. You were. Um, research and then having you work with us in the Center for Writing and Scholarship and watching this all blossom and unfold. Um, I'm very, very excited for what you've come up here and I feel as though um, I want to welcome you into this world of assessment 2.0, this kind of humane assessment we're trying to practice. Thanks. But I know that you probably need a week or two to figure out what you're going to do for the rest of your life. <laughs> Only a week or two. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> but I would hope that you would think about this because, and I would put this out to everyone at CIS, program evaluation and assessment, oh my God, it's, it's a place for our people to work, because we can get the social side of it and also the rigorous side, but there is so much work. I plugged in assessment in higher ed jobs 3,497 wow. today. Hmm. Um, yeah. So there you go. And I think uh, the Institute should be thinking about program evaluation and assessment as a core skill for our grads. Oh, that's, that's a, a good, good idea. idea. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much, Matthew. And um, for my part, I think, uh, you know, we have a group of maybe 20 plus people in this room just for you to know. And so I just wanted to acknowledge everybody's presence and, and that they've act they're all part of this, you know, experience. And some are done, some are, will be done soon. And, and uh, so I think this is really relevant. And I wish that you had a chance, like we as community members have had already, to look at this document actually because it is kind of complicated um, when Heidi came to me about a couple of years ago we talked about doing this I was just sort of thinking in the back of my head oh my god what are we getting into because it is complicated you know we have uh, a program that's been around for a long time it's really changed a lot and um, no one ha has really traced this change in a kind of a systematic way uh, students have come and gone. We don't have access to them necessarily. And um, so, you know, uh, besides anecdotal evidence and some other things and some documents and 
you know, in our past catalogs about what this program is supposed to do, we didn't really have much to go by. So we're really depending on this dimension, which is the experience of students. And I'm really glad because, you know, Heidi has been talking about this being a component of program assessment or program evaluation. And I've been saying, but you know, Heidi, this is not about program evaluation. Program evaluation is about a whole other set of things. And it's charged from another level. And it does it never involves students. And so, well, that's the way. That's a, that, but that's of course, yeah. That was your presupposition about it, right? Right. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Exactly. So, you know, now we know how how important that is. And uh, but I think you know it really is. Uh, uh, she did a great job in the sense that first of all, this is a mixed method study. She you know making a, a questionnaire and uh, refining it, working on it. Um, is quite a deal, you know, and I, I'm sure you learned some things. Maybe, maybe you can say some more about that. Doing qualitative interviews and processing that information is, is you know, another piece. Then integrating all this information. And I think you will probably do this for a long time to come, even after you're done with the dissertation. There's, there's plenty of material, and it's hard to just talk about it in a half an hour. And perhaps you can find opportunities to say more about it when you have a chance to synthesize more of this. And But I do, Heidi, want to challenge you to something here as, as your chair. And that would be, um, if you were to just summarize um, from your heart, you know, not from your feeling heart, but from the heart of the learning that you've had and all the conversations, how would you, what did you say What are the most important things that you found out in terms of what students are saying and if you had, you know, only two or three sentences, you know, that we should be thinking about in terms of all the things, you know, distilled into those essential things, can you just give us a chance to kind of understand what were the um, discoveries for you that were the most important as you ran into this? And, and especially if you had some ideas prior to this, like you had assumptions about the program or other students and they were challenged or they were confirmed in some way or just give us a sense of you know like the five minute three minute uh, summary of the findings that you can think about right now just so you know honey this is the elevator talk question <laughs> right. yeah. <laughs> yeah. well um, I mean, sorry, I just feel like a lot of things are coming up right now when you when you asked about that because really there's like three different sets of data, right? There's the, the scale, the open-ended questions that were after the scale, and then the, the interviews. So, and, and for me, really, the open-ended questions, like, we could have just not done the qualitative piece. I feel like that part was so rich because it gleaned uh, students' understanding of integral education and their view. And really, a, a lot, uh, I, don't, I don't know the percent, but there was a, a good chunk of people who, who expressed an expanded sense of self or a deepened self-knowledge as a result of going through their program here. And that also leaves me with a new question. It's like, okay, so what is an implication? What are the implications of having an expanded self, sense of self or a deepened self-knowledge? Like what, like Matthew kept saying, transferable. Like what is it that that will mean out in the world? N nobody really elaborated on that, which is why I thought about maybe I should have asked the open-ended questions before doing the statements, because I was wondering how did that work? Were people using the statements to, you know, inform their responses? I, I don't know that. And then, you know, in the, in the second phase, I, that, was, that was sort of confirmed in, in the more in-depth piece. People reported that as being something they took away uh, from their time here. And 
you know, what was really important, I feel like, were these ambiguous themes. Positive aspects of EWP, takeaways of EWP, critiques of EWP and what EWP lacked. Because the distinctness in the responses of these really give a lot of information. Classes that were important, spiritual counseling, Eastern theories came up a lot. People really value that course as like foundational in, in their development as, as moving into budding scholarship. And, <clears throat> you know, this, you know, this was reported in the first phase as indirect, but, but people found it valuable to learn how to hold multiple and even conflicting perspectives. Um, and so what are the implications of that, too? And people reported, you know, stronger sense of identity, you know, more, more awareness of their strengths and their passions. You know, I don't have the direct quotes here, but what I loved was there were a couple responses in the open-ended questions that said, you know, with EWP, you can write your ticket anywhere because you, you become yourself, you know? Oh, so nice. that was really beautiful to me. But then on the other end of the spectrum, you had other students saying, you know, I don't know what to do. So how can we, like, lessen that extreme gap, you know? Did you get a sense that uh, from the conversations, especially the qualitative part, that there's a sense of um, what is interval education to begin with that people have, or did they have to figure that out for themselves and, and define it for themselves? And does it really depend on each person's subjective view, or was there a sense that you got that mm -hmm. from your literature reviews and some other mm -hmm. information that you have now about integral education? Yeah. Do you think people are getting what they're, um, what they think they're getting? You know what I mean? Um, well, since some some people responded like, you know, we don't actually explicitly talk about these underpinnings or the historical lineage of the people that founded the Institute and inspired the founding of the Institute. But yeah, people seem to understand, you know, honoring multiple valid ways of gaining knowledge, honoring multiple perspectives and worldviews, honoring uh, the multi-dimensionality of personal subjective experience and, you know, the invitation to develop along multiple lines simultaneously. That, that people seem to understand that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in fact, I, just last thing I'd like to say is yeah. that the four criteria that you said, which is one, one version of saying what is integral, some assumptions like multi-dimensionality, non-duality, mm -hmm. holism, and evolution, mm -hmm. If you actually look back at um, all the things that people are saying, even though most likely few people ever saw those four principles because they it wasn't did, yeah. published until just, just recently, and it was something that Chaudhary put forward and someone back then wrote down at one point, but it was never really discussed publicly. Yeah. But if you actually look at it, everything that people are saying can be essentialized into mm -hmm. a translation of those principles. So there's something going on here that is beyond language, you yeah. know, that people are really in coming into an experience that somehow speaks for itself, and the contribution is from, from the students. I just wanted to uh, point that out. But again, I recommend that when she has this laid out in, in full version, that you really take a look at all the things that are said, because there's really a lot, um, a lot that people have, have contributed. So. Um, if you folks are, um, are good for a few more minutes of conversations here with the public or the attendees, uh, we can maybe take about five or ten minutes and then conclude. Would that be okay with you, Matthew and Dorit? Yeah, I need to. If I, if I'm slipping off here, I have another meeting that I have to get to in about 15 minutes. So. Okay, let's, let's do about five or six minutes and uh, we'll try to make that minimal right now and then people will have a chance here to talk afterwards. So. Uh, I just wanted to open it up to anyone. I don't know if Carol Carol's here. Any anyone else who wants to talk about the program or questions that you might have for her? 
Well, Heidi, I just want to thank you so much for saving me in my work with Matthew. <laughs> <laughs> who is that? It's Carol. Oh, oh hi, Carol. Hi, how are you? Because <laughs> uh, Heidi, Heidi had a real interest in assessment and has really helped our program with, uh, with her, uh, the energy that she put in and helping Matthew and just her, her mindset being able to be interested in it and getting so many people involved and so many students committed to participating in it. So I'm just so grateful uh, to you, Heidi. And I think that this work that you're doing for us is fantastic for us to have this dissertation that will be kind of a reference tool for us. Mm -hmm. That you've done a great job. And appreciate it. I'm so glad that you're there on the receiving end, Carol, to get that, because yeah. it truly is an amazing gift back to the program, and I'm just really delighted that you all get that. Yeah, absolutely. Because, you know, who, you know, it's, the other thing about it is, it's, we have to depend on the young generation to get out there and do this. <laughs> absolutely, that's so true. <laughs> they and got the energy. Heidi's so well connected with everybody. They got the energy, yeah. and they're connected, and these are, you know, it just doesn't come naturally to, you know, a certain generation of professor. <laughs> <laughs> but then we have somebody like Heidi to help us. And you, Matthew, you're oh. amazing. Oh, you know, well, to I miss be, you all. I'm going to come and have lunch with you soon. That would be great. Any questions from the folks sitting there? Yes. Um, one thing that struck me, Heidi, you know, when you look at these multiple ways of knowing and people come to a program like this already embedded in certain approaches to mind, body, spirit. And it seems like almost a monumental task to be able to try to herd all these different perspectives into one transformative model. Did you look at that and, and how you know this pluralistic perspective on say the spiritual dimension or the body dimension the mind dimension, I think, is a little easier because that's usually what people think about when they think of higher ed. We're all going to read the same book and we're going to talk about it. But when you bring in the spirit and the body, everybody has different ways of looking at that. Did that come up at all? Well, I mean, in terms of like the, because for example, in the interviews, like everybody told their story in a way that sort of, to me, reflected that they had this seeker tendency. So like a lot of people came to the program, they were already doing like Reiki or, you know, Hakomi or, you know, archetypal psychology. Like they're already coming with that attitude, like, yeah, the desire for intentional psycho-spiritual unfolding, really. But, but I don't think anybody called it that. <laughs> um, but integral can actually hold all that. In, in its in its principle or ideal, you know, mm -hmm. because it'll meet a person where they're at and uh, honor the subjective experience. So, I mean, were were you kind of wanting to know if if anything? No, oh, I think you said oh, it right oh, there. Okay. Can it hold it? You know, yeah, and I guess yeah. un, you know, understanding that in itself is really valuable. And I think, at least for me, is going through this program, maybe naming that. In, in a deeper, more profound way, you know, it almost seemed like it was just out there. And this person was doing this, this was doing that, but it was never really honored and supported and said, "This is okay." Mm -hmm. But we're going to engage something that's larger than all of these because they have a common dimension, which is the word you mentioned, seeker. Mm -hmm. Everybody is pursuing growth or in their own way, mm -hmm. and that's the way we're going to pull this into integral, mm -hmm. and we can all be okay with it, and we can move forward in our own growth. So that, yeah, that's, I love that's that word you used. Yeah. So Heidi, hi Matthew, Dory, this is, is that Karen Jenke? It's uh, Karen Nelson Villanueva. Oh, that Karen, hi Karen. <laughs> hi. So many of my beloveds in the room. Yes, yeah. I know, where are you? <laughs> uh, so, Bob had mentioned this work of Chowdhury and these four, four, um, four aspects of, of integral education that he brought to the institution. And I'm looking through this, and I'm, I'm not finding it here in, in your writing. Where would I find it in your dissertation? Mm -hmm. um, well, it's in the introduction, It's because I basically outlined the underlying um, assum assumptions or worldview, because the integral worldview <coughs> is sort of the underlying premise that 
birth integral and education. So it's in the introduction and it's also in the lit review when I talk about uh, Dr. Chaudhry's um, integral education in his own words. Okay. Because you're going to read it? Yes, I am. <laughs> I was going to ask, and, and then if I use it for a teaching skill. Of course, yeah. Great. I'll, yeah. I'll let you know. Go ahead. Yeah, Who's speaking to He doesn't know Ndi, he knows Ebedi. Um, so, early on you mentioned that there are other schools who try um, integral education, like the Jesuit school. Can you say more about that? I'm really curious to see how CI as a model of integral study really stand alone. Mm -hmm. or differ from the James Reed, whatever, mm -hmm. integral approach? Well, I, I, I basically, because integral education defined in its like simplest way is like a holistic education or a whole person education. And I mentioned other, because I basically did a, a Google search, and I mentioned some other universities, well, I don't think I did, but Boston College, um, Hong Kong Baptist University, all these random things like have the literal language whole person education uh, as a way to market what they're doing. And, and f for a long time you have Jesuit educational institutions that welcome spirituality into the academic setting already and honor that multiple dimension factor of a human being. So. Uh, yeah, I wasn't actually saying that Jesuit schools offer integral education, no. but I was using it as like a way of situating it because what I wanted to be clear is there's other schools that are attempting to offer an education for the whole person. And, and that integral education at our school is distinct specifically because we have our underpinning in the integral yoga philosophy of Aurobindo and the mother. Yeah. Sure. Heather? Yes. Um, so, nice job, Heidi. Thanks, Heather. One of my questions for you is, um, you mentioned the underpinnings in integral yoga. I think as I see conversations unfold about the ideals, I see that they reference less and less the integral yoga roots. And I'm just curious if your study, you know, does it speak to that aspect of is, is the integral that you're presenting in some way is independent of those underpinnings? Mm -hmm. Do you think that the definition can stand alone from that, or is something lost? What do you think? Well, I mean, that I feel so great because I feel like it is, in my experience, it was lost. You know, I didn't know about any of this stuff till I actually started doing this dissertation, and I felt like wow, this is so rich and so unique. Why isn't it more like, because basically if you look back at the old course catalogs to when the school opened, there were like core courses for all students, no matter what program you were in. And I feel like these things were <coughs> discussed more openly. Um, but yeah, I mean today, don't see a direct link from the ideals and the mission. I mean, we have hi the history of CIS. It's up on the website. But it, it does. It seems a little disconnected. And so I, I guess part of my work here was in service of showing the connection. And the other thing you can do is have them read that double issue that we did in revision that, that yeah. sketched the history of integral education at the Institute, Heather, and also situated it with respect to the kind of other um, content, uh, con contenders for the term. Yeah. So that double issue of revision, I think that I know Judy used to hand, hand them out to people until she ran out. <laughs> but um, I think that's a useful look at the sort of, on the one hand, what's the unity and also what, what's the tension. Yeah. yeah, that'd be good to get that back. Yeah, we have those, and, and also, like Jeremy, who's doing research on this topic, knows that there's been a lot of recent publications also. Great. Integral education is coming out, you know, especially out of the symposium. We've had quite a few articles coming out in a couple of different issues of interval review, and 
So okay, there's there's yeah. slowly you know materials coming coming out to the surface, but but we're not quite there yet probably in terms of where we want to be. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did that kind of answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Jeremy. Yes, I'd be curious uh, to follow up on that, Heidi. If you could speak to what could be some possible benefits for enrolled students if they are given the orientation maybe more explicitly in terms of um, the integral yoga tradition as an orientation to help them better understand the type of education that, that we're espousing uh, within EWP and within the Institute of Realm. I mean, my biggest hope is that it would be a good way for us to distinguish ourselves um, because I guess what I would hope is like what if what if we could help students be able to you know become experts in whatever program they're doing and experts in integral education like I feel like that would be a, if we you know if we were able to talk about it and practice it effectively as writers and educators, I think that would be very marketable in terms of getting a job. Because, I, like, I, I showed the, the crisis picture, right? I mean, we're in a state of change right now in, in the system across the US anyway. So I would think that universities would be hungry for something to revive the the, the drawing out or bringing forth of what the student has got to bring to the world, the gifts they can bring and the passions they can bring to the world and, and help them like remember that they love learning. Does that help the answer? I mean, yeah. go. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you Thanks, so much. Matthew. Thank you. Matthew. Nice Matthew. to meet you, Matthew. It's very nice to meet you, Dora. I hope to see you in uh, time and space at some point. Yeah. Okay. Take care. Thank you all very, very much. Congratulations on your defense. Thanks. Bye-bye. So we probably can take another question or so, but then we should probably uh, lean toward finishing this part and concluding, and then we can hang out a little bit and ask you more questions. Any more, uh, Adrian? Well, I had an observation, um, and, and it, it addresses a couple of things you touched upon and, and things that are, are classics in, in EWP in particular when people graduate and say, wait a minute, how am I going to get a job with this? Um, but uh, it, it's my perception that a fundamental aspect of Orbindonian integralism is uh, self-responsibility. Uh, like in the integral yoga, as you said, there isn't a, a path laid out it's made, there are like guidelines and suggestions and it's up to the individual to find their own whatever path, whatever practice at that time is right for them. So similarly, um, did, you, did you interview Jean Johnson by any chance? I didn't. Mm, well, so Jean graduated in 75 from EWP and, uh, and then discovered that she couldn't get a job with her, her EWP degree and she went for more training and became a registered nurse mm -hmm. and that's what she makes her money at but I'm, I'm friends with her and she's told me many times that her experience in EWP was life-changing totally enriched her life she wouldn't give it up for anything so now I'll bet that when she got to that point and she was saying like I can't get a job with this there was a whole lot of griping going on but once she overcame that hurdle her lasting, uh, you know, appreciation of what she got from from the enrichment or the understanding of herself and the cosmos and all that kind of stuff that we do in EWP was a uh, lifelong standing. So another thing you mentioned was uh, some category was how does what you find in EWP match your expectations when you come in? And it's you know Matthew just signed off, but his whole deal with with Entre, uh, edupreneurship yeah. uh, refers to the changing uh, landscape in, in education. If, if I had gone right through school without taking a, a detour, then uh, as long as I did well in my studies, you know, when I graduated I could expect 
various job offers or entries into grad school, you know, to be offered, and it's just not like that anymore. Mm -hmm. So I think that uh, if we, if the department makes clear that what we're doing here is about you, the person, and it is not specifically a shoehorn into a, uh, you know, a job niche in the market, then, then people will be divested of inaccurate or inappropriate expectations mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and will begin to realize from the get-go that it's up to them to figure out where they're going to take this and what they're going to do with it. Uh, so I think that, you know, if the department, if we, we could put it right on the, the website where the, each department has their own little blip and, you know, we should say something like that mm -hmm. uh, in terms of, of ethical, you know, or a stance and honesty, um, you know, and say this is, you know, you, instead of saying this is what it won't do for you, we could just say this is what it will do for you and it's all about you, the person, uh, you know, and say it's up to you to take the, to translate this with your native abilities into something in the world. So, but I think that's a feature of, of integralism, the self-responsibility, the individual, you know, taking charge of your own evolution uh, that, we, that we hope to bring into this education. And, and that will eliminate a certain amount of, of discontent or, you know, mistaken impressions from the beginning. I can piggyback on that. Yeah, real let's, quick. let's uh, do, do a couple minutes for sure if there's any responses or do uh, you have a response to it? Yeah. Okay, do you want to respond? I mean, yeah, that's a great idea. And I think Craig has, and, and the whole team has, like, you know, they're always, you know, at different mm -hmm. retreats and stuff, reviewing the website material and making amendments as, as, as we grow. Um, but let's really coming up for me right now is like if we can help students understand the underpinnings of integral and, and somehow you know encourage the shift from egoic to you know from from operating from an egoic place to operating from a heart place and this isn't like foo foo california stuff this is like something that can be very profound like if you're communicating and honoring the wisdom of your heart you know that that could be you're, you're connecting with your soul and, and at that point you can trust the process and the unfolding whether you have a job or money or you know challenges or or, or gifts so yeah so a few things i've heard uh just inspired this um i hear a lot about getting a job and and I think we need to th and especially in graduate education I think we need to think about creating jobs or at least for ourselves because especially at a school like this where you don't fit into a spot you, people don't even know what you're talking about and that's the other key part is if we can communicate our knowledge and skill set better uh, that will help across the board yeah. I mean because we have the knowledge is being obtained or, or you know it's happening we're graduating uh, people are graduating from here so something's happening um, about how do we communicate that to the world and show that it's beneficial then people will want us to do things for them mm -hmm. yeah so I, agree. Yeah. I might I might just add one last thing here is that if we want to even take it to show our window and so on he, he would say something like you can't teach anybody anything yeah. So basically, what we we have is you know souls that are that have really strong potential, but there's so many dampers that come up from educational and social systems that don't allow us to grow. Mm -hmm. So this is more like creating a fertile soil for mm -hmm. the soul to, to really f you know, flourish. And I think we are trying to offer an education and not a training or any, anything that has to do with you know. A, a, job situation, that's always a worry and a concern for all of us who have to pay rent. But I think what we work on is really to allow the opportunity to draw the highest potentials and then that will sort of speak for itself. When I was in Heidi's place and graduating 30 years ago and, and didn't know when, whenever that was, I forget, actually about 20 years ago or so, I was so nervous what I'm going to do with this. And uh, Bina Chaudhary told me 
don't worry, the people who value the kind of thing you have to offer will come to you. Mm -hmm. Or mm -hmm. it, it, the world will provide that. You don't have to go sell yourself. Just, you know, and the more of this sort of people in the world, the easier this will become. So you I think told you that? Yeah, yeah. You I, told me that. You told me a lot So let me just say that um, we had um, talked earlier with the committee a, as far as uh, where Heidi's at, she has some revisions to make that um, are still pending. So we, I don't think that there's anything else here that we need to, uh, we talk about. Do we just want to double check with you? I know Matthew gave his blessing indirectly, but do you have any concerns that we should, you know, know about at this point, or should we congratulate Heidi, and then we'll figure out the, the revision that she has to make to the final draft, and then we'll take it from there. Yes, by all means, uh, Heidi. It's, uh, you're very clear about uh, little, um, a few more uh, revisions that you're that you flagged and you're preparing and you've uh, submitted that document today. And um, you know, I trust that all of that will to be taken care of. And congratulations. Thank you so much. Same for, on behalf of the whole committee and everyone here. Thank you, Heidi, for all the work you've done, and congratulations. We have one more thing before we chair up, and I don't know if that's the right time for that, or should we just continue with, with this part, and then, didn't you? What did you say? Did you stop? Mr. Kishan, you Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I forgot about that part. Oh. <laughs> she is a doctor. <laughs> 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 Thank you so much, Doreen. I know your time is precious and it's kind Thank of late you, over there, dinner time probably, and uh, I'll stay in touch with you and hope to see you soon. Okay. Thank you, Brahma. Thank Take you care, so much, Doreen. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Okay. Goodbye. Take care. Thanks. Bye -bye. All right. Well, what did we do? <laughs> <laughs> um, can I yeah, I think there is. Uh, I, I have um, something from Craig for you. You do? Because, yeah, because he couldn't be here. Aww. But I'm going to, because I'm physically here, I get to say something before I read his, <laughs> <laughs> his blessing to me. Um, firstly, I just, I, I really want to congratulate you from the bottom of my heart. I, um, I think that something you, you said in your dissertation really resonated deeply, which was that you applied uh, self-compassion through the difficult times. And I think that, you know, we always talk about East-West psychology being a rites of passage, and you took the rites of passage class with me. And I think that there's something about uncovering and remembering who we are, which is what you did. You know, like the Buddhists say that, um, you know, we have Buddha nature, that we just have to, you know, look in the mirror and remember who we are. And I think that your journey is a testimony to remembering all parts of yourself. And here you sit, you know, you're, you're a doctor, and you have done this incredible uh, work uh, to get here. And it hasn't been easy. And it doesn't mean that it's going to be easy when you leave the door. Um, in fact, my question to you is, what now? Like, if you had anything you could do, what would that be? What's your next book? Uh, where to from here? And maybe you don't have to answer it right now. Unless you have. <laughs> first thought, first thought. Yeah, I don't know. I was, I'm going to get married three days after graduation. Oh my god! <laughs> we have an integral wedding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know what that looks like, but I'll consult with Bauman on that, I guess. <laughs> no, I mean, yeah, I have potentially a job opportunity at the school as program coordinator in front of me. I have potentially a class I'll teach in the fall. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, I basically come to realize as part of my process too is like PhD doesn't mean you, you walk into a full professorship. So, you know, just kind of, yeah, I'm looking forward to the next step and, and, and building my teaching and, and publication resume and, and go from there. 
<laughs> okay, Craig's words. I'll try not to cry. <laughs> <laughs> Dear Heidi, although I'm not here to congratulate you in person, I want you to know how proud we all are for your latest of your achievements as we welcome you into the community of PhDs. <laughs> I also want everyone hearing this to know that Heidi has not only passed a significant personal and academic milestone on her journey through life, she does so while filling an important and stressful career position as acting program coordinator in our department. As if that weren't enough, Heidi has been a key resource in the department's self-assessment, a fellow at the Writing Center, and an invaluable support for me as department chair. All this, together with her achievement of a PhD, signals a very bright and well-deserved future indeed. And I extend my heartfelt congratulations to you, Heidi, with the respect that you go out and celebrate till the cows come home. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, you can have tomorrow off. <laughs> <laughs> the formal part of the event should be over by now, but we'll continue on with what we need to do. And thank you, everybody. And I was honored to be part of this process as well. Thanks all. Thank you, Bonner. Heidi, Heidi. Yeah. <laughs>